I would now like to invite our chief guest of the evening, Deputy Prime Minister Teo Chi Hien, to please come up to the stage and address us all. Thank you for your patience. I'm inherently a centrist, so when I'm offered either to be on the left wing or the right wing, I get a little bit confused. <laughs> Mr. S. R. Nathan, former President of Singapore, His Excellency Dr. Raghavan, High Commissioner of India to Singapore, Mr. Guraja Pandey, Chairman of the Organizing Committee of IMPACT 2013, Mr. Sanjeev Iyer, President of the Pan IIM Alumni, IIM, IIM Alumni, Distinguished guests, welcome to Singapore. To our guests from overseas, a very warm welcome here to Singapore. It's my pleasure to be here with you on this special evening. I'm told that this is the first IIM alumni event that brings together alumni from both India-based and overseas IIM alumni chapters. We are happy that Singapore has been chosen to host this inaugural event building on the strong ties between India and Singapore and the long-standing connection of many IIM alumni with Singapore. The theme of this global IIM meet, New Frontiers, is a timely one given the opportunities and challenges shaping the global economy and it ties in very well with the history of the IIMs itself. Seeking New Frontiers is something, therefore, that IIM is familiar with. The IIM is globally recognized for its role in developing business leaders for the corporate world. And I hope that Singapore's position at the crossroads of global and Asian influences helps set the stage for a lively exchange of ideas. With globalization and the internet, the world has become more interconnected and interdependent. Trade flows and investments in the region and around the world have significantly increased, as has the flow of ideas and knowledge across borders. Countries like China or India, which used to be giants in population terms, but pygmies in world trade and investment terms, have grown to become giants themselves now and have a great influence on what happens in the world economy. We have seen an unprecedented increase in companies expanding their overseas presence. Challenges in the G3 economies are driving many companies to look outwards, especially towards Asia for growth. At the same time, many Asian companies are also keen to internationalize and extend their global reach. For instance, emerging markets account for 55% of Unilever's revenue today, while the Tata Group and Aditya Birla Group earned close to 60% of their revenues from outside India in 2012. This era of globalization has brought about a change in the type of executives and leaders required to operate and helm businesses. Having a core set of business skills and knowledge is no longer sufficient. In fact, as we were discussing just before coming in to the hall for dinner, what is this core set of business skills? And is there a wider range of skills that business leaders need today to operate in a paradigm which is different from the paradigm of the American model of business leadership, which many business schools, and I believe even the IIM, draws its history from? Instead, Global companies today require people with a global orientation, individuals who appreciate and can successfully navigate the varied business cultures and ways of doing business in different regions. To be successful in this new world, it is thus important that business leaders are equipped with the necessary skills to manage and integrate a diverse workforce, work well with customers, suppliers or partners, while respecting their different cultures as well as harness the strength of cross-border collaborations. Indeed, companies are increasingly paying more attention to the need to attract 
retain and develop a robust pool of professional and leadership talent. According to a Deloitte report, American companies increased their leadership development spending by 14% in 2012 to an estimated US $13.6 billion. In the Asia-Pacific, a 2012 survey done by Mercer on 30 companies found that close to one-third spent more than US $5,000 per person annually to train and develop their senior leaders. Business schools have noticed the growing need for this new breed of global executives and are transforming themselves to meet these demands. Business schools themselves are also globalizing. The French business school ESSEC, for example, offers an Asian track, the Global Manager in Asia, as part of its Masters of Science in Management program. Business schools are also forging partnerships to enable cross-border exchange of insights and knowledge. The joint EMBA program offered by America's Kellogg School of Management and the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology brings together business knowledge and influences from the East and the West. We are happy that IIM Bangalore has recently inked a management research and education partnership with the Singapore Management University. Other business schools, such as Francis INSEAD and ESSEC, as well as India's SP Jain School of Management, have gone a step further to set up overseas campuses. These campuses play an important role in a number of different ways. They help these schools internalize the concept of globalization even in the school's own operations, in the orientation of its staff, in its program offerings, and in the diversity of its student body. This makes the schools themselves more attractive to students and makes their graduates more marketable as they have had a fuller international experience at the school. As companies seek out new markets, especially those which may be quite different from their own home base, they will increasingly need to build a better understanding of local cultures and norms and build healthy mutual respect. To succeed in the globalized world, multinational companies not only need to hire local technical specialists and country managers, but must also groom local manpower to take up higher corporate positions, including leadership positions. For example, at General Electric's Leadership Development Campus in New York, 40 to 50 percent of participants are non-American employees from multiple geographies and businesses, no doubt including quite a number of alumni from IIM. Singapore's multicultural and multiracial society provides a useful environment to help companies understand local conditions in different countries. In 2010, Procter & Gamble established its Asia Leadership Development Centre in Singapore to train 500 managers across Asia annually. Sony has also set up its first leadership campus outside of Japan in Singapore dedicated to developing leaders for Sony's businesses in, the, in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Unilever also established its Global Leadership Development Center in Singapore to develop its pipeline of corporate leaders for developed markets, as well as for Asia and other fast-growing markets by using Singapore as a base. Indeed, Singapore's location and connectivity, as well as its global orientation and multicultural society have helped to provide an ideal location for global companies to connect to Asia and for Asian enterprises to connect to the world. Our strategic location has historically made Singapore an important center for trade and commerce. Today, European and American companies such as GlaxoSmithKline and Hewlett-Packard use Singapore as the base from which they can better coordinate and direct their activities across this region. Asian companies such as Tata Communications and Amore Pacific, Korea's largest skincare company, have also chosen to use Singapore 
as their springboard into global markets. However, Singapore needs to differentiate itself, to add value to companies that are interested in this region. One of the ways in which we do this is to develop talent with pan-Asian expertise to help companies drive businesses and innovation for Asia and the world. We are working closely with companies to address their talent needs through both sector-specific talent initiatives as well as leadership and talent management efforts. One example is the Leadership Initiative for Networks and Knowledge, or LINK, spearheaded by the Singapore's Economic Development Board. LINK brings together business schools, human capital consultancies, and think tanks, as well as companies, corporate universities. LINK aims to help companies address their leadership development and talent management needs by strengthening the collaborations between corporations, HR experts, and academia. One key player in LINK is the Human Capital Leadership Institute. This institute helps companies develop global leaders with a strong understanding of Asia, as well as Asian leaders with the ability to lead on the global stage. In particular, the Human Capital Leadership Institute's annual Singapore Business Leaders Program helps business leaders navigate geopolitical developments in Asia, identify trends that are shaping current business strategy, and gain insight on human capital and leadership in Asia. The Institute also co-organizes the annual Singapore Human Capital Summit with the Ministry of Manpower and the Singapore Workforce Development Authority. The summit brings together business leaders, industry practitioners, and academia to discuss leadership management and human capital practices in the Asian context. Besides hiring and investing in the development of local talent, we are also seeing companies and business leaders going a step further to contribute to the local communities where they are located. We hear stories of conglomerates and SMEs alike contributing their time and resources towards meaningful local community projects. I've been the patron for a charity event for the Singapore Children's Society, which sought a way to raise funds during the dark days of the global financial crisis in 2009. They sought to raise a million dollars by bringing on board 1,000 enterprises to donate just $1,000 each per year. The project has met with success with several companies not only making donations annually, but encouraging their staff to volunteer their time. There is thus space and scope within each company, big or small, to build stronger links with the community through corporate social responsibility. And I'm heartened to know that some of the Singapore-based IIM alumni have taken the lead to create an Indian Business Leaders Roundtable within the Singapore Indian Development Association, or SINDA. Besides organizing dialogue sessions to facilitate engagement between the business sector and the government, IBR members also contribute their time and effort to SINDA activities and help to raise funds for SINDA. I'd like to commend their initiative and welcome more of such efforts by business leaders to contribute to the community. As companies look to expand beyond their shores, business leaders will need to be tuned to the business practices of different markets around the world and work well with people from different cultures. I hope this two-day global IIM alumni event will help to promote networking and dialogue among business leaders like yourselves as you explore new frontiers. I wish all of you a fruitful and productive conference and thank all of you for your presence here in Singapore. Thank you very much. Ethan, one of the questions that came up and I think you alluded to it is, do you see overseas Indians who have settled down here integrating well into the Singaporean ethos and what specific messages would you have for the alumni gathered here in this regard? Well, we welcome uh, Indians who have come here to work in Singapore, some of whom have taken up uh, residency 
and citizenship. Singapore has always been an open society and it's an open society in which we welcome people but it always requires two hands to clap. So um, it requires uh, an ability to fit in with the local cultures, multiculturally, multiculturally, multilingually and to get to know people and to live and work together with them. So this is one of the characteristics of Singapore which I think makes Singapore an attractive place for people from all over the world and this is something which we want to preserve. Uh, continuing on the theme, I think um, uh, there is a question about what measures any Singapore is taking to ensure it remains an attractive destination for businesses setting up a headquarters here in the future? Well, we hope that the region itself will provide a magnet and an attraction because where Singapore is located, we are conveniently located between these two huge giant economies which are really powering the world today, India and China, each with its own model of development but each with huge potential. And we are also located in the middle of Southeast Asia, the ASEAN region, with five, six hundred million people. And also just north of Australia, which has huge resources and potential as well to contribute to the world economy. And we believe that this very central location, this very central geography, is in itself a great advantage. But of course, geography alone is not enough. And it's important to create the right conditions for companies to want to come here, for businesses to want to locate here. So we believe that the combination of connectivity through good air and sea links, through good telecommunication links, but also an openness to ideas and to business to come here, to set up easily and to be able to grow from here into the region. And we intend to continue to remain open for business in this way. Thank you. Uh, this one is a very interesting one, DPM. And for those of you who are sending in questions, this wonderful technology pigeonhole comes from a local startup uh, and they've really done a great job for us today. This one's very interesting. We've got eight votes. It says, why do we not see more investments from Singapore into India? I'm not 100% certain that, that it's uh, accurate, but it's perhaps a question that you'd like to address. Why do we not see more investment? <laughs> Is that a question for Dr. Raghavan, you think? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, it's a question of whether you see the bottle as half full or half empty. I think Singapore has been one of the most active investors um, in India. And ultimately, we see Singapore's role not as a bulk investor, but as a catalytic and quality investor. And I think that has always been where Singapore has been able to play the most useful role. Because if we were to compete in bulk terms, that means the more terms, just in quantitative terms, then there will always be countries which will be able to do more than Singapore in bulk terms. But I think what Singapore has been able to do in those countries which we have invested in is to actually be the pathfinder, to show the way, to sometimes um, encourage, sometimes cajole the countries in which we are investing in to actually be open to more investment as well. And by investing in certain areas, in certain regions, to set the pace, to show the model that actually foreign investment uh, is possible uh, in these regions in which investment may not have come before. So other investors are encouraged to do so and also to help encourage other regions within the same geography, within the same country to also open up because they may see that foreign investors are not the sort of ogres that foreign investors are sometimes seen as when they invest in a country. So I think Singapore's role really is one of pathfinder, quality and leading and showing the way sometimes rather than bulk and quantity. Uh, this is a very interesting question, DPM. Is there, is there scope for IIM to set up an overseas campus in Singapore? Would we be welcomed if we did? 
Well, I can give you a, a three-letter answer. Yes. <laughs> we so we've got, we got five so. directors in the room, so that's... <laughs> and uh, you and the... Uh, this one's not up on the screen, but it's something somebody asked me. Uh, you and the cabinet have talked recently about a more inclusive growth agenda uh, in, in Singaporean conversation, in your national conversation. What implications do you see this having for business? Uh, do you see things changing in terms of being business friendly as opposed to people becoming more important? Mm. Well, I think in every country in the world today, they're facing stresses because what has happened with globalization is that um, uh, incomes, income equality has stretched out. And you can see that in both developing as well as developed countries. Mature economies as well as economies which are just going into their growth phase. And this causes stresses and strains in every society. And in Singapore, we are seeing that as well. So when we talk about inclusive growth, what we are trying to do is to have growth which brings everyone along so that we don't have people left behind. And it's growth which brings benefits to everyone. Uh, just now, you know, it's, it's not, uh, when, I, when I came on stage and I said I'm essentially a centrist and not left or right, uh, that was a joke, but actually that's true. And I think that in Singapore, basically the government's orientation is to take a very balanced path, neither to be so out and out pro-business that workers are exploited, nor to be so pro-worker that businesses get disadvantaged. And this is what, this is the balance that we've always been trying to strike and which we will continue to strike for the future. And we have a unique way of trying to do this, which is the tripartite partnership between government, unions, labor, and businesses, in which we think that by working together, we can develop a win-win positive sum kind of situation rather than the usual um, uh, contentious zero-sum win-lose kind of game which characterizes labor relations in many countries. Uh, DPM, the questions are coming uh, fast and uh, quickly and we promise not to keep you for more than two or three more minutes but in the same way I think uh, a lot of people here are business people and I think this is an interesting question which has got six words. Singapore is already a high-cost location for most of the industries. What are the steps that you are planning to take to curtail this decline? I mean, to curtail this cost, I guess, not decline. I think one must not look just at cost, but at value. And I think as a businessman, I think um, that's really what you're looking at too. That means not what it costs you, but what is the value that you can get out of a person you employ, a location that you are in, a new business that you are open, a new line of business you're opening. So I think one must not look only at costs, but one must look at value as well. And when one looks at costs, one must also look at the totality of the costs that are involved in doing business in a particular location. And in some locations, I suspect that there are more hidden costs than there are a typical, than, than a typically doing business in Singapore. In Singapore, generally, what you see is what you get or what you pay. And we hope that with this kind of transparency, ease of doing business, that even though the sticker price may look higher, but the total price and the value that you get out of doing business in Singapore is well worth it. Thank you. DPM, um, I am going to ask you to take two more because the questions are very interesting and uh, I think particularly for India to be a leading business hub given that it's not a city state, would the Singaporean model of efficiency work? In other words, if Singapore were as big as India, what changes would we need to make? If Singapore because this is a constant as India. thing that comes up about <laughs> Singapore being a city and India being a large country. Each country has its unique challenges. Um, I had the good fortune of uh, um, sort of sitting in the shadows of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew when he's visited India a number of times, over a number of years, as, um, as, uh, as India uh, went through uh, its sort of uh, liberalization and opening up phase. And I would not dare to make the kinds of pronouncements that only Mr. Lee can. <laughs> but, but I would say that 
in some ways, let me put it this way, India is fortunate to be the size and the diversity that India is, and Singapore is fortunate to be the size and diversity that Singapore is. <laughs> and I think we should. Uh, that is what, what we should each try to do is to maximize the advantages that we have. In the case of India, its size and its enormous market, and minimize the disadvantages that, that India has. And in the same way, we try and maximize the advantages that we have, which is speed, nimbleness, and try and minimize the disadvantages which we have, which is small market and so on. So we try and overcome that with connectivity, speed, nimbleness. Uh, I, there's another follow-on to that. What is the secret sauce behind the excellent governance practices that make Singapore such an attractive destination? The secret? Secret sauce. 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 You know, what, what, what's so special about Singapore that you have created? <laughs> I think this came about really at the birth of the nation. When people decided that if we don't collectively put our shoulder to the wheel, we are not going to make it. And if we want to make it, let's do it together, work hard, get it done. And I think that realization united people and made it possible for us to do things together in a way which it has not always been possible for other nations which have been perhaps better endowed, um, faced uh, less of a sort of existential kind of crisis situation. And that allowed the creation of a certain ethos and with people who provided us with great leadership, direction, hope, motivation to go along in a certain direction. And when we were able to see at least the initial fruits of success, that motivated us to work even harder and push even harder along those lines. So I would say that those were the uh, foundational um, sort of moments that set Singapore on a particular path. But if you were to distill certain um, uh, key ideas from that, which has made us able to compete in a very challenging world, I would say it comes down to the three core things. Meritocracy, multiracialism, and the ability to deal upfront and openly with corruption. And these three things, I think, have served us well and continue to serve us well, particularly in a world which is very complex, competitive, and multicultural today. Thank you, DPM. That was very insightful. Um, I think we have run out of time for further questions, so I'd like you to all, I'd like to thank DPM Teo Chi Hin for a, wonderful present, for a wonderful speech as well as answering all the questions so well. Thank you very much for gracing us with your presence here today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.